Eric Voorhees, thanks for joining me on Real Vision. Uh, I know you've been here a few times chatting with a few of the crew. You guys had a pretty big announcement yesterday by the time this airs. Um, you know, we might be a week or two out from it, but uh, I guess without further ado, maybe for people that aren't familiar with Real Vision and aren't familiar with you and Shapeshift and your company, can you give a brief overview of um, what you do? Yeah, thanks for having me on. So Shapeshift has been around since 2014. Uh, our initial form was that we were an exchange, essentially, where people could trade one digital asset for another without an account, without custody, without an intermediary. And, um, you know, basically, we've transformed the company uh, in multiple ways over these years. Uh, today, we're more like a, a full-featured crypto interface uh, that works across chains. So you can send and receive like any, any standard wallet. Uh, you can track your portfolio, you can trade digital assets, all those basic things. Um, but just yesterday, which was the 14th of July, uh, we announced that we are decentralizing the entire company. So that means that we are dismantling the corporate entity. It means we are open sourcing all technology, all software, all applications, front and back end. And we're moving from a paradigm where we have governance and economic accrual based on you know, a shareholder uh, model to governance and value accrual based on a token model. And the latter being um, far more global, far more immutable, and something that is far more compatible with an open source crypto interface. Super interesting. I, I, we've seen um, a bit of a trend this way. I mean, I think this has been one of the thesis the thing that a lot of people have had who see where crypto is going is that the value accrual is really in the networks and these these global communities really um and so i think it's amazing <laughs> what you guys did i mean i think i think it's just a start we're going to see a lot of companies going that way and that's kind of where Thanks. we envision um our company bedali going as well more on the payment side but starting to eventually decentralize over time and disintermediate ourselves because that's i think really where the future of this where this stuff goes yeah so, it's i i think it's like a a good example of a new model for economic organization for the 21st century like everyone just still uses these c corps and llcs which are territorial and which have all sorts of friction that was needed or helpful in the 20th century, but are just a burden for trying to build an economic organization in the 21st, particularly if it is purely digital and if it's trying to be global. So yeah, you know, hopefully others will follow in this path. I don't think it's appropriate for everyone, but um, we're going to try to see how far we can push it. Yeah, it's really groundbreaking too, I think. Um... I read through the announcement uh, as well as your your tweets, and I think you articulated things really quite well. So kudos to that. Uh, what was particularly interesting, I think, for this was um, the basically the native asset or governance token distribution and how you guys did that. I think you know we saw a little bit of you know people basically being rewarded for being early adopters on a platform, but I think the challenges that we've seen with a lot of the DAO distributions um, for governance tokens has been, do they end up being concentrated into the hands of a few? And you guys have, you know, I think really pushed the boundaries there. I think I saw, maybe you can confirm the number, but the number of addresses uh, being distributed governance tokens is significant. Yeah. I I think it's the largest airdrop in history in terms of recipients. It was a little over a million. So these yeah. were, you know, past Shapeshift customers. These were members of certain DeFi uh, communities. Um, so it was an airdrop to a very large, broad group. And it was, it was about a third of all the tokens went out to that group. Um, and then about a fourth of all the tokens put into a community pool governed by holders of the token. So well over half of all the tokens are now in the hands of no one who is related to an insider. Um, yeah. So that that was an important threshold that we wanted to get. You know, like for transparency, I have about five percent of all the tokens, and I'm I'm the the largest owner. Uh, the next largest owner is like one or two percent of them. So it, we, the whole point of it being decentralized is like the more decentralized you can make it, the more successful it can be. So it was an easy decision to not be greedy and like keep a, a large portion of the tokens internally. 
Yeah, if you believe, I think it comes down to one of the things that I've learned a lot you know, over the last few years operating in crypto is before I, I did a lot of open source work. And so one of the challenges with open source is very much very similar. You know, you got a bunch of parties that kind of come and go. Uh, the incentives around that have been around really, you know, contributing to a common good, sometimes uh, pride, sometimes uh, recognition, right? But the interesting thing with crypto now is we have this combination of that plus actual economic incentives. Yeah. And I think, I think you know, the challenges that we ran into on the open source side, I'm optim cautiously optimistic that this may actually be able to create a sustainable model for open source peer-to-peer -peer software. Yeah, it's it's super cool because, you know, before tokens, before crypto, you, you couldn't monetize that well. And so if you were really interested in an open source project, it's purely a, it's purely a work of love and that's powerful and important. But if you always have to choose between, you know, how do I earn money? How do I earn a living? And what do I do that I'm passionate about? I think crypto has been one of those magical areas where you can actually do both. You know, people are making a lot of money in crypto and many of them are doing something that they are highly passionate about and that they believe will change the world for the better. So I'm I'm glad to see the um, the potential for profit in the hands of people who are passionate about projects. I think that's a really important step and something that is fairly unique to the crypto industry. Yeah, I agree. And I think the the thought that I didn't quite finish there was just around incentive alignment and just how important that is. And so I think you know we. We're diverging a little bit from what I want to talk about, but I think it's important initially when we schedule this call, and I'm hoping that we come to it, some of the, you know, the importance of self-sovereign uh, money or, or money separated from state and how CBDCs and some of that stuff kind of plays in. But I think I'd like to dive a bit more into, you know, uh, how you guys thought through this process of uh, DAO, how you, even some of how you went about it, but I think because uh, I think it's really, uh, it's groundbreaking. I mean, what you guys have done, you're not the first DAO, but I think a lot of ways you push the boundaries forward in terms of the distribution. And I think what's been really interesting to me with crypto is just how important incentive alignment is. And I think where a lot of DAOs get criticism is, you know, oh, how much is allocated to the early founders or the team or whatever, and how much do they hold? And I think this is partly, you know, we're still figuring some of this out, but I think, and what, it, what are the right numbers? I think they're a little bit variable, but what a lot of people, I think if they haven't done startups or haven't invested or haven't done things in the past, they tend to just say, oh, this is a cash grab, as opposed to recognizing that, you know, I've, you guys have been around for a long time. There's a lot of your own blood, sweat and tears and and probably money and stuff that has gone into building Shapeshift to what it is. And you took on a significant risk because that could have failed. Right. Yeah. And so I think part of it is rewarding the people who took on those uh, those risks that were much higher than if people are, you know, joining Shapeshift today. Yeah, I think I'd I'd frame it like, you know, we we have been a 100% centralized company with a with a cap table with investors, and um, all value accrual of the entire Shapeshift platform accrues to that group, and that's the traditional model that every company has. We're stepping out into a realm in which a larger and larger portion of the value accrual can accrue to our users and to the broader community. So where we were 100% of all value accrual ends up in the hands of shareholders, we end up somewhere le far less than that, you know, where 10, 20, 30% might end up in the hands of some of the early investors. But the bulk, the majority of the accrual and the governance over the direction actually ends up in the hands of the people actually using the application. This is a, this is a really cool transition. Um, so yeah, aligning incentives, like that's, that's what this is all about. And, um, a rising tide lifts all boats. You know, we now have more interest. We have financial interest in the outcome of our customers in a way that we never had before a token. I think that's that's a special thing and, and a lot of companies can maybe realize that that's very valuable. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to like and subscribe for more crypto related content. 
Also, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com slash crypto.